Shriraja Uvacha. Let's see. Okay, we'll do the next. Shri Sukha Uvacha. Indrena Rita Chatrena. Rita Kundala Mandana. Rityama Radhi Stanena. Yapito Moma Chaitasam. Sabar Go Gaurudas Daha. Rajotisha Puram Yo Yo. Sri Sukho Uvacha Indriya Rita Chatrena Rita Kundala Baduna Rita Marari Stanena Kyapito Bauma Chaitasam Sabargo Gladrudaha Rajoti Sapuram Yaiho Chant Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, do the Bengali? Do we have to translate? Is this translation? No? Everyone every understands English? Okay. So verse number one. This is the beginning of the chapter, the killing of the demon Naraka. King Parikshit said, how was Bomasura, who kidnapped so many women, killed, the, killed by the Supreme Lord? Please narrate this adventure of Lord Sangadavas. Mm -hmm. Verse 2 and 3. Sukadev Goswami said, After Boma had stolen the earrings belonging to Indra's mother, along with Varuna's umbrella and the demigod's playground at the peak of the Mandara mountain, Indra went to Lord Krishna and informed him of these misdeeds. The Lord, taking his wife Satyabhama with him, then rode on Garuda to Pratyotsita Pura, where, which was surrounded on all sides by fortifications consisting of hills, unmanned weapons, water, fire, and wind. 
and by the obstructions of mora, pasa, wire. Translation, mora, pasa, wire probably means, means bob wire, something like that. The acharyas have explained in various plausible ways why Lord Krishna took his wife Sachivama with him. Srila Srihar Swami begins by saying that the Lord wanted to give his adventurous wife a novel experience and thus took her to the scene of this extraordinary battle. Also, Lord Krishna had once granted the blessing to Bhumi, the goddess of earth, that he would not kill her demoniac son without her permission. Since Bhumi is an expansion of Satyabhama, the later could authorize Krishna to do the needful with the unusual nasty Bombasura. Finally, Satyabhama had been miffed by Narada Muni. He brought a celestial flower to Queen Rukmini. To pacify Satyabhama, Lord Krishna had told her, I'll give you the whole tree of these flowers. And thus the Lord scheduled his procurement of a heavenly tree within his eye. Dinnery. Krishna knows how to do many things in one go. <laughs> Even nowadays, devoted husbands take their wives shopping. Yes? <laughs> this is not for the brahmacharis. And thus the Lord took Satyabhama to the heavenly planets to get a heavenly tree, as well as to retrieve the goods Bombasur had stolen and return them to their rightful owners. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti notes that in the heat of the battle, Queen Satyabhama would naturally become anxious for Lord Krishna's safety and pray for the end of the battle. Thus, she would readily give permission to Krishna to kill the son of her expansion, Bhumi. Utale, Shmati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine, Namaste Sadhusmati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Hirsesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Karine, Pancha Kaupa Turu Vesya, Kripa Sindhu Pe Bhaja, Nanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaho Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Bhutananda Sri Advaita Gada, Shiva Siddhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 So the Supreme Personality of Godhead is perfect in every aspect of life, even knowing how to please his wife. <laughs> it's a duty of the husband to somehow please their wife. And that's not easy, but still, the duty is there. <laughs> There's a lot of duties that are not easy. So in this case, what is Krishna doing? <clears throat> He's doing something quite unusual. <clears throat> He's taking his female consort, his wife, to a very difficult battle, <clears throat> where usually ladies are not involved in such fighting activities. But there's a reason why he... Krishna wants to accomplish. Of course, Krishna is the supreme protector. So, rake Krishna more ke more Krishna rake ke. If Krishna wants to protect you, <clears throat> nothing can in this universe can do any harm to you. Krishna's power is complete and supreme. But if Krishna doesn't give you protection, even if you are surrounded by armies and generals and many kinds of invincible weapons, still you can't survive. <laughs> so this is very important to understand that with, with the protection, when Krishna is there, there is always protection. There's, as it says in the end of Bhagavad Gita by Sanjay, wherever there is the Supreme Lord, wherever there is a pure devotee, there is opulence, victory, morality, and extraordinary power. So the presence of Krishna in our life makes everything Perfect, and that is the actual goal of life, to bring Krishna into our life. But you see here in his pastimes in his, uh, with his wife, he thinks of different ways to please his wife and at the same time get his mission accomplished. 
it says that sometimes when we do something, we we have a particular goal for when we want to do something, and usually there's a one one goal in mind when we want to we want to do something. So we look for that ex that result and we go for it. But when Krishna does something, he does five or six things at once, <laughs> or maybe more. He knows how to do so many things at the by doing one thing. This is the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He, he's, uh, he wants to get rid of this demon, but he promises. Now, he makes a promise. And so they say one of the highest qualities in, in human culture is to give you a promise and never break it. This is called human goodness. Human goodness. There's three things that make up human goodness. One is to... Give your word and keep your word, despite whatever, you know, just like you say, yes, Guru Maharaj, I will chant Hare Krishna 16 rounds and follow four regulative principles throughout my whole life. Please give me a name. Okay. You are Japadas. Okay. <laughs> and then after some time, how many rounds are you chanting? Well, I chant 16 rounds in one week. You know. I get 16 rounds done, but it, one week takes. <laughs> so after some time, the promises are somehow been challenged by circumstances, and circumstances wins out, and the promise falls away. But that, that is not a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava gives his word, just like a Vaishnava says he's going to do something even if it's difficult when the time comes, or even if it's even dangerous when the time comes, he will not give out, he, he will not go back on his word. Especially for those who are in the Dharma of Kshatriya. They will never break their word. They consider breaking their word as worse than death. And death is even more suitable than to give up. Just like Arjun. <clears throat> Arjun, when he was fighting when Abhimanyu was killed, <clears throat> he decided to kill Jayadrath, who was the cause of killing his son Abhimanyu unfairly. It's a very long story in the Mahabharata. And so Arjun said, I will kill Jayadrath, or if I fail to kill Jayadrath, I will enter into fire and give up my life. So he was determined to do that. <clears throat> And, but Krishna was also listening to this whole promise. And so there was a great battle. And the Kauravas knew that if, if they could protect, protect Jayadra from being killed by Arjun, and Arjun gives up the life, then the Kauravas would definitely win the battle because of the presence of Arjun. And it was very difficult for them to win. And so it was a good plan. And the Kauravas did everything. They put their best generals around Jayadrath and put him at the end of the, end of the battlefield. The battlefield was 28 miles long. <laughs> That's how big that battlefield was. <laughs> 16, 640 million soldiers were killed, and of course many millions survived. So it was a big area. And so Arjuna was fighting, and Krishna's on the chariot, <clears throat> and Krishna's encouraging Arjuna don't waste time with these other soldiers. Go right for Jayadrath. Because the rule is that once the sun goes down, the battle stops. So if they could protect Jayadrath all the way until the sundown, then Arjun would have to enter into the fire. So they had some of the best generals. There was Dronacharya. There was also Diodana. There was even Bhishma. They were all giving protection to Jayadrath. It was impossible for Arjun. And they kept Jayadrath way at the far end of the battlefield, where Arjun would have to fight so many other soldiers to get there. But Krishna said, don't waste time, go right for Jayadrath. And so he was fighting, 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 he getting closer and closer and closer. But it was getting late in the afternoon, and the sun started to make its descent over the horizon. And then... Um, as, as it was going, Arjuna wasn't able to get to Dryadrath. It was becoming very difficult. And the sun was heading down. 
And then finally, what happened, it appeared that the sun set. And then when the sun set, all the Kauravas said, Jai! And then that meant Narjuna is going to enter the fire, and they stopped fighting. But then Krishna said, kill him. <laughs> so Arjuna went and killed Dryadras because now he was unguarded. And the Kauravas thought, what is Arjuna doing? He's breaking Kshatriya codes. Once the fighting stops, then the battle ceases. But what Krishna did is he took a cloud and covered the sun to make it look like the sun was down. And then after he killed Dryadra, Arjuna, Krishna let the cloud go and the sun was still in the sky. <laughs> so, Rake Krishna More K. More Rake Krishna K. Then, if Krishna wants to give you protection, all of the laws of material energy can't, can't destroy it. This is a nice example how Krishna. He's perfect in all many and Kanti Pratijani he maname bhakta punashiti. He's always giving us protection to his devotees. In fact, he breaks his promise. Just like he said, I'm not gonna fight. But when it came to Bhishma Dev wanted to destroy Arjun, so he was fighting like the the whole story goes that uh, at night after the battle they would come together, the two armies, they would sit together, the leaders, they would sit in the tents and they would talk and they would have, you know, some refreshments and talk as friends. And then the next day they would fight as enemies. <laughs> this is Kshatriya codes. So Arjuna came one night after the battle and uh, there was there and uh, um, Krishna had told Arjuna that, um, you know, Diodana, he owes you a promise, so you collect that promise for him, from him. So he went to Diodana and said, my dear Diodana, remember you gave me a promise I could ask anything from you. Diodana said, yes. What do you want? You want to win, the, you want the battle? No, no, we'll fight. What do you want? Well, actually, what happened the day before is that uh, Diodana, I have to go back a little bit, and, and said to Bhishma Dev, Bhishma Dev, you know, you are the leader, you are the general of our army, but you're not fighting. You're not fighting to your capacity. And that's an insult. You tell a Kshatriya you're not fighting to their capacity. That's like an insult, a big insult. Our Bhishma Dev said, all right, tomorrow I will destroy the entire Pandava army. And he had the power to do it. <laughs> Bhishma Dev was so powerful that in he, and he also had a, a boon where he could not die, only if he wanted to die. And so when he got insulted, he said, all right, I have these five arrows. And with these five arrows, I will kill the five Pandavas, for sure. And, but Diodhana said, all right, but I'll keep the arrows with me, and then tomorrow you can get the arrows. And Bhishma Dev gave him the arrows. But then Krishna knew, or I sent Arjuna to ask for the promise, and when Diodhana said, what do you want? He said, I want those five arrows. <laughs> and then Diodhana couldn't get so he gave the five arrows. When Bhishma found out that he was tricked, he understood it was Krishna's trick to protect Arjuna, so he was fighting really fierce. He was smashing. He finally, he, when he came to Arjun, he smashed his chariot with him. Arjun, Arjun fell off, the, and Krishna fell off too. <laughs> Krishna hit the ground. But then Krishna decided, now I have to protect my devotee. So he picked up the broken chariot wheel, and you see the picture. He's running full f with, with his eyes are like red, like fire. His charter is blowing in the wind, and he's running so fast that the charter falls off, and then Krishna just keeps going. And Bhishma Dev was thinking, thank you very much. <laughs> this is what I wanted. I wanted to see, you know, Parthasarthi. <laughs> I wanted to see Krishna in that battlefield mood. And so he was fighting with Krishna, and then, of course, 
Uh, and then uh, Arjuna came and fought with Bhishma Dev, but Bhishma Dev didn't fight back. And Arjuna, of course, meant that, that was when Bhishma Dev was shot with so many arrows, but he didn't die because he still had that uh, boon. So Krishna broke his promise. So some people say, well, you know, we like Ram better because when he says, you know, he keeps his word. But Krishna says something and then he tricks you. He says, you know, this Krishna consciousness is really easy, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> For the spiritual master says, chant, dance, and eat prasadam, and that's all there is. And then, you know, Acharya Ratna comes and says, you got to go out there and dig a hole, you know. We need some construction. <laughs> so, you know, so you can, you know, there's other things. You're like, you chant, dance, and take prasadam is uh, the essence of everything we do. But, you know, we have to also dedicate our time, energy, and resources in order to give that to Krishna. Because if we keep anything back for ourselves, then that is not full surrender. So, and it's what it says, Manaso Deho Geho Yokichu Arpi Lup Tu Alpane Nanda Kishore. Bhakti Vinoda Kori prays like that. And in my life, my wife, my home, my, my possessions, my body, it's yours. It belongs to you. I am yours. Krikita Janmo. How does that go? Krikita Janmo. Bhagatu Anna. Somebody asks, us, what is complete surrender? You just chant that mantra. That's, it. that's, complete, that's complete surrender. Now, it doesn't matter. I'm yours. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. Alishyava pinaratam punastuma vadarshanam marmahatam karotuva hitatata vavdadatu lampato matpranam nastu sevananda. But maybe we're not ready for that level of surrender yet. But that's okay. But if we have faith that in Krishna and very carefully execute the process of devotional service, we will understand how everything in life centers around our relationship to Krishna. Nothing is separate from Krishna. You see here, and he's taking time to take care of his wife. <laughs> he wants to bring her to the battlefield, but he has a motivation. And that's Krishna. Just like I was saying, you know, you can't trust Krishna because he says one thing and does something else. And what are you going to do? You have to trust the spiritual master. <laughs> He's more in line. So it's not that Krishna is untrustworthy. That's not, the, that's not the point. It's that he always acts on the highest level of benefit, and benefit for his devotee. So if his devotee gets in trouble and he has to break his promise in order to save his devotee, then he'll do that. He'll do that. Ram, when, Ram, when apparently Sita was, you know, captured by Ravana, and then after the battle was over, the battle of Lanka, and Sita was back, Ram said, you know, you're impure. You've been touched by another man. Can't take you back. And he was serious. So he was following very strictly, you know, these principles of Dharma, especially when it comes to, you know, Putni Dharma. What is it called? What is what is husband called? Pati. Pati and Putni. Yeah, okay. Pati. Pati. He was following very good strictly the principles of a uh, a strict husband, according to Vedic culture. But then, when Sita proved herself, she was back, and Ram was happy, and then they were in Ayodhya, and then Ram's walking one day. He used to go and to see what the people were saying. He would sometimes go in disguise to hear the, what the citizens were speaking about. Sometimes they would be speaking about him. So he heard one man chastising his wife. Where were you last night? You were out all night. I didn't see you at all. Now you're coming back. You expect me to take you back? You're unchaste. I'm not like Ram. 
takes back his unchaste wife. Whoa, when Ram heard that, even though she proved herself before that, and Ram said to Lakshman, I think, I think we have another plan here. We have to send Sita away. Of course, that man was later on the same. He took birth again in Krishna Lila, that same person who was chastising his wife. He came, he was the washerman in Krishna Lila, and Krishna cut off his head. <laughs> he gave him a haircut, he shaved him up, and made him ready for his next life. <laughs> so, yes. So in that sense, you see how Ram was, was dharmic in everything he did. But Krishna follows dharma on a higher level. It's like he has so many wives. Right? He has 16,108 queen, queens. He's one person, right? So many wives, gopis, lakshmis. He expands himself. He likes girls, right? So many girls, right? There was one court case in America where we were accused of worshiping a licentious God, <laughs> a God that has that likes to play with so many girls. <laughs> and so they, they, the Christians, they took us to court. It was a big court case. It was a famous court case, and they were going to. He said, try to prove by legal, da, by legal declaration that we were unauthorized for following some kind of, you know, bogus religion. There's God who's got so many wives. And what kind of God is that? So that was, that, was the, that was the accusation against us. And so when the case was going on, there were many Christians in the, in the courtroom. And some of the Christians were nuns. They were these women who were, you know, Catholic nuns. So our lawyer was really good. He had a good lawyer. He said to the judge, can I ask the nuns in the courtroom a question? And the judge said, yeah. Isn't it, then he said, yeah, he said to the nuns, isn't it true that when you take your vow of becoming a nun, you, be, you actually declare that you are the bride of Christ. And that's their vow. They take a vow that I'll become the bride of Christ. So they, they couldn't lie. You know? and they say, yeah. So the lawyer said, just see, Christ has so many wives. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, when, then we won the case. They threw the case in. <laughs> It was the whole thing. So, yeah, so that's the point. It's not on a material level that Krishna has so many wives. Here he has one wife here, Satyabhama. She's the one that never listens to Krishna. She always argues with Krishna. She's actually an expansion of Srimati Radharani. And come again in the form of his queen. There's one story where um, Krishna was there. Um, Satyabhama was with Krishna. And then uh, Balaram was there. So Krishna called Garuda and said, Garuda, go to Ayodhya and tell, him, tell uh, Hanuman I want to see him. Bring Hanuman. So Garuda, very dutiful, flies to Ayodhya. And there's Hanuman. He's worshiping a deity of Ram. And he's absorbed in worshiping. So Garuda says, he tries to get the attention of Hanuman. Hanuman, Krishna's in Dwarka. He wants you to come. You can jump on my back. We can go fast. And Hanuman, he doesn't want to be bothered. He's worshiping Ram. So he doesn't listen. He doesn't even, he doesn't even acknowledge the presence of uh, Garuda. So Garuda's persistent. Finally, Hanuman gets disturbed, and he takes his tail, and he hits Garuda. And Garuda goes, without even flying, he lands all the way back to Dwarka. 
And then uh, Krishna said, what happened? <laughs> no more missions like that, please. And he said, well, you know, he's Hanuman's busy worshiping Ram. He didn't want to come. All right. So then Krishna said, all right, you tell him Ram's in Dwarka. And then you bring him. And then Krishna took the form of Ram. And Balaram took the form of Lakshmi, Lakshman. And then he said to Satyabhama, you become Sita. And she said, no. <laughs> she refused. <laughs> and so Krishna was stuck. <laughs> so then he went to Rukmini and he asked her. And she said, of course. <laughs> She's more obedient. <laughs> If you get married, don't have more than one wife because it's really a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said just to maintain one wife in Kali Yuga is so difficult. <laughs> and so um, now Hanuman goes again and then he comes very carefully. He's thinking, uh oh. And he said, Hanumanji, Krishna is in. Uh, Ram's in Dwarka. Come immediately. He wants to see you. And then the Garuda looks at him. Where's Hanuman? He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Even before he finished, and then when Garuda went back to Dwarka, there was Hanuman sitting at the feet of C uh, Lakshman, Ram, and Sita. That's a nice story. Of course, we made the point that, you know, Satyabhama doesn't listen. But that's nice. Krishna likes that. If you're married, you know, and everything is going nicely, it's boring. You, know? you need some excitement in the marriage, so you fight with your wife once in a while. And that keeps the life in, you know. This is not for brahmacharis. This is for the, whoever else is married here. <laughs> it keeps the, the relationship, you know, fresh. Of course, don't fight too seriously. That's a problem. Yeah, so uh, Krishna takes his wife, and then because she, Bhumi, is an expansion of Satyabhama, and he wants to kill her son. So he know he already kept his promise. So he, if he gets the blessings from Satyabhama to kill Bhomasura, then he, his mission is successful. Because when the devas are in trouble and they can't manage things, when the demons become too powerful, then what happens? They, they go to they, first they try to go to Indra, but Indra's in trouble here. He can't do anything. Bhumasur is even ta stealing things from Indra. So they go to uh, Brahma. Somehow Brahma didn't get involved in this one. I guess he was too busy. So they went. So Indra went right to Krishna instead of going to Brahma this time. Sometimes he goes to Brahma. And Krishna said, all right, I can take my wife on a pleasure trip and at the same time fulfill your desire. So that's Krishna. Just like many times the, de the demigods get overwhelmed by the demons. And then Brahma comes and comes to that's what happened when we read about Krishna's appearance in the material world 5,000 years ago, is that the earth was overrun by demoniac forces and Bhumi was under a lot of stress. So she went to Indra, Indra went to Brahma, Brahma took all the main demigods and went to the shore of the milk ocean and offered beautiful prayers called Purusha Shukta prayers in order to bring the Supreme Lord into because even Brahma couldn't couldn't turn around the power. The, the demons sometimes, sometimes just like it says, when the mode. This is a very important verse. It's in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It says when the mode of goodness is prominent in society or in the world, the demigods are in control. When the mode of passion is prominent in the world, the demons are in control. When the mode of ignorance is prominent in the world, the rakshasas and yakshas, really low creatures, 
they are in control. That's why you see there's so many problems now, because the demons are in control. That is today's society. It's run by demons. <laughs> may not, it's, people may not be demons, but they're being used by the demons to uh, exploit the rest of the society. And there's so many problems now. And that's the problem, the demons. People are generally good, but because of the influence of the demons, they become bad because of that. And what is, what is the demons' propaganda? What is their main propaganda? Don't listen to authority. Become your own authority. You know what's best. You know what's right. You can make your own decisions. You're a free person. And then people start ex accepting this idea, you know, rejecting authority, because authority becomes something like a, some kind of restriction in people's life. So they think, well, but you have to work with authority and under, to understand the benefit of uh, working under authority. But sometimes, we, just like sometimes people used to say, this is for the West, that we would be preaching in the West and we'd say, um, you know, you should practice Krishna consciousness, you should practice spirituality, you should practice Krishna consciousness. You know, you should come and become a member of our society. Sometimes we give direct. And they say, we don't believe in organized religion. So we tell them, we're not organized. You missed the joke. <laughs> <laughs> We're not an organized religion. We're pretty unorganized. <laughs> but we're trying. <laughs> but that unorganization takes the form of chanting, dancing, and feasting. <laughs> if we can organize around that, then everything is organized. <laughs> so the point is that that, that the world right now, in general, is being controlled by demons, very powerful demons. You don't even know who they are. They work above the governments, and they have power within the governments. They control the governments. They control everything <clears throat> through various agencies. And they've been doing this for the last three or 400 years. They've been just increasing their power more and more and more. But don't worry. Lord Chaitanya's movement is here. And Lord Chaitanya's movement will eventually push out this demonic influence. But it's up to us to do it through the process of Harinam Sankirtan and developing self-sufficient, come back to the land, cows, agriculture, simple living, high thinking, not so much dependent on this materialist civilization. India now is being inundated by the Western ideas that you have to have big buildings, you have to have nice cars, you have to have nice clothes, you have to, everything has to be first class. And, but <clears throat> once you start doing that, then, then where does, you have no time for, for the most important thing, and that is, you know, to Brahma Jigyasa. Human form of life is meant for self realization. So it's not wrong to have nice things, but it's wrong to substitute nice things for our spiritual practice. That is the problem. <clears throat> and that's what's happening. People think, yeah, we've been too long following God and religion and spirituality. Therefore, now we need to, as Prabhupada said when he was in New York, he was preaching at one college. It was an engineering college. And one boy at the end of the college, he said, Swamiji, what you're saying is very nice, but we, now we need, we need uh, technology. This is what we need now. So that's the mood now. You have to have technology. You have to have all of these things. And you have to have a plan to make more of it. So that's demoniac. 
because it saps the energies of the earth, it saps the energies of the individual. If we want to conserve time, energy, and resources, direct everything towards simple living. Cow protection, agriculture, all of these are the basis of a happy life where life becomes easy and then we can chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Because we need time. We need time. Okay, so I'll stop here. Let's see if there's any questions or comments. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I have two questions. One is, uh, you, were thinking, you were talking about three principles of human goodness, if I am correct. Right, I mentioned only one. You mentioned one, so other two. The second one is that when someone is in need and you can help them, you should do that. That is, that is another principle of human goodness, to help when a person is in need, whatever need they have, if you, if, you're the, if you can make a difference, if you don't, you're actually falling below the proper attitude of a human being. When someone is in trouble, when someone is in need, if you can do something to relieve their suffering, that is, that is, that is human goodness also, whatever it may be. If someone is unhealthy, if you can help them be, get back their health, if someone is... You know, in trouble, if you can do something to, to mitigate their situation. And the third one, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I just can't remember the third one right now. But there are three. Keeping, keeping your word, uh, helping others when they're in need. And what's the last one? I just read it last night. It's Kali Yuga. Can't remember. Kali Yuga memory goes, right? Thank you for sharing two principles, man. You know, I'll, I'll find the third one and I'll pass it over somehow. That my second question is we're talking about the the quality of demons to deny any authority. But then Prabhupada also wanted devotees to be uh, independently thoughtful, independently thoughtful. Yeah. So where do we draw a line? Uh, what is independently thoughtful and what is denying the authority? Yeah, independently thoughtful means within the context of what is acceptable. That means I use my independence, my thoughtfulness to how to increase the quality of my service, how to preach Krishna consciousness, how to maybe develop more projects that will be beneficial. In other words, it's always, it's not about negativity. Yeah, it's within the context of the process of bhakti to be independently thoughtful. In other words, just to follow the rules and regulations of bhakti, it gets you off the material platform. But bhakti begins when you actually use your intelligence how to serve the Lord nicely. That's rules and regulations are just to protect you from falling into maya. But bhakti begins when you actually are engaged nicely in devotional service. So in that engagement, you can use your thoughtfulness in order to how to improve the quality of one's service. Just like Sometimes the rules and regulations are restrict bhakti from developing. So one has to be able to see that. Just like niyamagraha, one of the principles is niyamagraha. That means following the rules and regulations just for the sake of following and not know why you're doing it. And the other aspect is niyamagraha, means to reject rules and regulations and act independently and whimsically. Both of those are faults in the, in the process of bhakti. So using your intelligence in a positive way, 
sukritina, not duskritina. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. That was very valuable. And you see, Prabhupada, sometimes he broke certain principles in order to do higher principles. It's like one time he was he was in the temple and Prabhupada was just there in the temple. A very, very important person came into the temple. <clears throat> so uh, Prabhupada was with some brahmacharis. He said to one brahmachari, well, bring some maha. He wanted to give some maha for the guest. So the devotee went back towards the Pujari room and the Pujari had just put the offering on the altar. And so he said to the devotee, you have to wait, it's just been, we just made the offering now. It'll be ready in 15 minutes. So the boy walks back to Prabhupada and tells Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, no, get it now. So the Brahmachari goes back into the Pujari room. In that time, the Pujari is chanting his Gayatri. <laughs> and then the, the devotee walks onto the altar, picks up the deity plate, and starts <laughs> walking off. And the Pujari, that was a fast Gayatri, really. So he's going back to Prabhupada with the deity plate, with the Maha on it. And the Pujari is chasing him. <laughs> and they both come to Prabhupada. So who's wrong? Nobody's wrong. They're following the Guru. They follow the spiritual master. And he can make adjustments according to how he sees those adjustments are made. And Prabhupada said, I made adjustments that people criticized me for. I allowed women to be equally accepted within the society of active devotional service. That was never done, generally, before that. But when Prabhupada preached in the West, he did that, because he knew in the West you can't discriminate. And he said, I became successful because of that. So Acharya can sometimes, but, and also devotees can also, who are really, fixed in their devotional service, who act only for the benefit of the Lord and the benefit of, of spreading Krishna. They sometimes can adjust religious principles. So that means independently thoughtful. That's an example of independently thoughtful. Any other questions? You said you had two questions, right? Oh, yeah, right. And then this one. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more questions? Prashna, Prashna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much for <clears throat> explaining so nicely. Mm -hmm. the, I had one question regarding this, uh, the pride. Uh, we, we find here this Indra. Indra in this episode is going to fight with Krishna for, uh, because, because Krishna would take the, the, the Parijata tree for the pleasure of Satyabhama. However, we have seen in the past that Indra has realized his insignificant position in front of Krishna in Vrindavan. And he has offered prayers. But uh, still, uh, he challenges uh, Krishna for the fight. We do the same thing. We fight with yeah, Krishna. So, the, so therefore, uh, how do we... Uh, the, the pride is so deep-rooted we can see here. I mean, yeah, what is also, the way? We, are, we also fight with Krishna. <laughs> he says, do something, and we do something else. <laughs> so how do we overcome this uh, pride, which is so much deep-rooted? Yeah. When you understand that whatever Krishna wants is for your benefit, 
if you can understand Krishna only acts for the benefit of the devotee. He's, he is the well-wisher of all living entities. So he may present something that is uh, that we can't understand. And then we have a doubt whether we should do it or we have a thing, we think we have a better idea. Indra, Indra, because he has a powerful position, look what, look what he did when, when, uh, in, when Krishna stopped at Govardhan, you know, the sacrifice. Indra sent all of these torrents of rain into Vrindavan, and he, that was serious. He wanted to kill the inhabitants of Vrindavan. So his pride and his position, if you have a lot of power and you have a lot of resources and you're getting a lot of responsibility, there's a, there's a tendency sometimes to become proud. Thinking that I have, you know, I'm important. But that's contrary to bhakti. Jiva surupai krishna nitya das. Trinata peace on each ena. Tayori vasa hishnana. Malinama manadena. Kirtaniya sadarahi. So a devotee always thinks that whatever Krishna wants, whatever the spiritual master wants, then that's for my benefit. And that's humility, and that helps to get free from this idea, because pride is centered around thinking oneself as the center. If you see yourself as the center, then that's pride. If you see Krishna and devotional service as the center, then that's real knowledge. That's real knowledge. So Indra, because of his big position, gets infatuated by that position. He thinks this parajata tree belongs to heaven. Who's he going to take it and bring it to the material world? It belongs in the heavenly planets. <clears throat> so yeah, we also see how Lord Shiva when Banasura came to Shiva saying that, you know, please save me from Krishna, Shiva went fighting with Krishna. <laughs> Even Shiva opposed Krishna. But he did it because Banasura wanted some protection and Banasura had surrendered everything to Lord Shiva. So, yeah, sometimes people become so powerful that they defy, they think they can defy the Supreme Lord. Maharaj, uh, if the power or position is, uh, is the cause for the pride, I am mean, going to play a very key role in, in, the, in the development of the, of the pride. Then why, when Indra was uh, requesting Krishna to take away the post, Take away the what? Take away the post, Ajindra. Take away the post, post, post of Indra. Oh, who? Krishna was taking away his position. Indra, Indra, why requesting? Because I am proud of the position and oh, the yeah. power. Yeah, so please take cool. away. But then Krishna said, no, no, you, you be in the post and position yeah. and you keep the service. So, if the position and the post uh, is, yeah. uh, they have the power to infatuate, yeah. so, so why that Krishna doesn't then? Mean, that doesn't mean you don't take position. You have to take position, take responsibility, because position means responsibility. But you have to be humble. <laughs> Both. You can't say, well, don't give me position because I might become prideful. But we need somebody for that position. So. The temple president says, well, I quit because I don't want to become proud. 
then you're going to have to find another temple president. <laughs> the position is needed. The guru thinks, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so learned. I have so many disciples. Everyone's chanting my glories. He thinks, well, I'm, I'm tired of that. I want to become humble. Then he's Arjuna. He, Arjuna didn't want to fight. Krishna said, "The so chaman was so chimpslam. You're a fool. I'm asking you to fight, but don't fight at a false ego. Fight because it is your duty." So oh, yeah. So you have to take. You, you can't give up your position because you're afraid that because the position will give you some wrong mentality. So a position is a, is a responsibility. A responsibility means more service that you can do. So Prabhupada said, and Prabhupada said, you make advancement in devotional service by how much you take on responsibility in devotional service. So it's good to get positions or situations because it's an opportunity for making advancement. It's opportunity for increasing our service. So Indra is there. I mean, Indra fell from his post once before, and he had to leave it. And then, uh, who was it that one? Somebody took his position. Nahusha, yeah. And then, uh, you know, Indra became a pig <laughs> in the material world. And uh, when Nahusha was kicked out because he was harassing so many people, in other words, he didn't do the job right, so he was removed. There was nobody to be king of heaven. So Brahma came back to uh, Indra and said, and there was now a pig, and he had his piglets, he had his nice pile of stool, so many good things. <laughs> and then Brahma said, we need you back in the heavenly planet to rule. And Indra, in the form of a pig, said, don't ask me that. I got my wife, I got my stool, I got my kids. Got all this nice mud to roll around in. So he didn't want to go back. <laughs> but Brahma wanted him to come back. And so Brahma started killing his kids. And then Indra started to wake up a little bit. And everything. And so. You know, there is spiritual pride, but spiritual pride means jivar sarupai krishna nitidas. I'm eternal servant of Krishna. But material pride comes in different forms. So what is the worst form of pride? Hmm? Pride of renunciation? The scriptures give another one. That's two, two of the six opulences. What are the other? Wealth. The pride of wealth is the strongest of all prides. When people are wealthy, they think, I don't need anything. I got everything I need. I can do anything I want. I can go anywhere I want. I can control other people. So yeah, so pride comes, so Indra, he's wealthy. <laughs> he's really wealthy. Do this and you say, I don't. well, I would like to do something else. He says, well, that's all right, you can do that later, but do this now. Then that's the instruction. Look what happened to uh, Agnidra. Right? Agnidra was completely renounced. 
No, we're not, not like Nidra. Priya Vrata. Yeah. Priya Vrata. Yeah, he was completely renounced, but they needed someone to uh, become the sun god. The sun god position was... And he was the only one qualified to do the service. And so Narada Muni was preaching to him about, you know, stay brahmachari. You know, your life will be easier. And then, but Brahma, he needed that person, so he had to fill that position, so it was his duty. So he he told, and Brahma's his graf his his, uh, his grandfather. So he couldn't refuse Lord Brahma. Brahma said, "You know, you get married, we need you in, because that service is for grihastas, not for brahmacharya. Difficult service." And so he did. He didn't want it, but he did it. But then when he got married, he started to become really attached to his wife. And then he started falling into Maya because of that. But then something saved him at the end. I forgot what happened. They took him out of the position. But yeah, so he was simply following the instructions, but because he was following instructions, he was going down. He didn't want it. But then again, at the end, he was saved. So if you follow instructions, even if you go down for a little while, Krishna will save you. But try not to get prideful, because pride is an illusion. We don't have anything, and we can, we're claiming to be so great. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Chaha Sarvasya Jahambradi Sanita Stomatat Smritu Gyanam Upanam Cha. If you want knowledge, it comes from me. Remembrance comes from me. Forgetful comes from me. And Krishna also says in the Gita, Rasoham Apsap Kunsaya Prabhaspi Suri Surya Pranava Sarvavedi Shu Sabdike Purusham Nishu Sabdike Purusham Nishu means I, Krishna says, I am the ability in all living entities. Whatever you can do, that's me. That's coming from me. So a person becomes free from pride when they realize whatever I can do or whatever I am, it's the grace of God, it's the grace of my spiritual master. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, it's 9.25 already. We can stop. <clears throat> Thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Gaur Vimanande, Hari Hari Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.